Okay, thank you. So I'd like to present um, some progress regarding the uh, EPW software since uh, last year. So I'm working in uh, the group of uh, Phil Chano, Justino in Oxford. Uh, I'm here and I'm also, I came with Martin who will talk about Starema GW just, just after me. So briefly, what is um, the uh, EPW software for those who don't know? So that's an electron phonon one year uh, code. So the main idea is you have um, some physical properties like uh, the Hamiltonian or the electron phonon matrix element. You compute that on a coarse K and Q point mesh. And then the idea is to use maximally localized one year function to uh, interpolate into real space. And then you can um, interpolate back onto a much denser K and Q point grid. And this is very useful for some uh, physical property that requires very dense uh, integrations. So the development since, uh, well, the last um, developer meeting in, in, in January 2016, there was some code beautification. Um, there was a, a bug correction related with uh, spin-offs and, and one-year localization that was fixed. Um, there is now the possibility to impose the uh, acoustic sum rule both in real and in reciprocal space. And this allows to use the same feature that was available in, in um, well, in Quantum Express. So, so you can use uh, crystal uh, sum rules and different sum rules. So that was uh, quite useful in some, some systems. Um, I added a um, new level of parallelization. So it's band parallelism, but it's only for some part of the code where it was uh, critical. But this can now be extended quite easily. Um, and then uh, there was some work done on the speed and memory optimization of the code. I also worked a bit on um, putting automatic documentation of EPW using the Ford uh, software and also increasing um, the test farm using uh, Billbot as well as looking a bit at the code coverage using Intel uh, code curve. Uh, so I will, I will spend a bit more time on those three uh, items. So first of all, the uh, optimization and performance. Um, I was made aware of this initiative. So this is called performance optimization and productivity. It's a European project, so anyone in Europe can apply. It's free of charge. You just go on the website, and you have to fill a, a small form. So it's something like less than two page. And then you get in contact with some people that will use, that will help you um, um, assess the performance of your code. So I actually, I did it for EPW. And um, together with them, we used uh, Scorpi and Skaska to, to assess the performance of EPW. And uh, this helped us to detect some load imbalance uh, due to uh, K-point splitting and also some I.O. And after solving that, the um, speed up was, was much better. So before that, uh, I was decently speeding up to, let's say, 200 core maximum. And the goal was to go to 1,000. And by doing, by doing this analysis, it was possible to get a decent, um, um, let's say, scaling up to about 1,000 core. So that was quite uh, useful. Um, about the, the documentation, so um, we tested uh, different ones, so also Doxygen. Um, in general, uh, so Ford is extremely easy to set up. Um, only thing that you require is wh whenever you put two exclamation mark, it will count as a uh, documentation that will be treated by Ford. Um, but the advantage of Ford is that it, it's really, it's still maintained. It's generate very good looking and uh, modern graphs. Uh, it supports LaTeX, uh, it uses Markdown, uh, and it's still actively developed. Uh, it's just a coincidence by, by someone in Oxford. He's a, a guy in, in Earth Science. Um, so that's quite nice. Uh, maybe I can quickly show you what it looked like for um, EPW. So this is really something that you get automatically uh, almost from, from the software when you install it. it. It's quite nice. You get all of those graphs. Um, that show the relationship. So, so this is the main uh, EPW executable. And then you have all the modules that are, that are called. And then this is all the subroutine that EPW calls. So it's a bit of a mess, of course. But then you can navigate, zoom, and whatever. And you can click. And then you go to this subroutine. And this is all the modules that this subroutine is called for. And then those are all the calls. So I think it, it's quite nice. You can always put comments you, you have. So I think if Quantum Expressor wants to move in the direction of automatic documentation, I really think that uh, Ford is the best one for Fortran. 
uh, and better than Doxygen. And, and I would definitely recommend uh, using Ford. And in the next uh, days, when we do the, the code first, I'm happy to set up Ford for Quantum Expresso. Um, obviously, I would need help to make the documentation, but I'm happy to, to start a bit. Um, yeah. And then the third item is uh, test shoot and, and uh, billbot test farm. So th at the moment, you have a test shoot in um, Quantum Expresso that mainly consists of um, PW, CP, and, e and EPW tests. And those tests are run then nightly by a billbot test farm. So at the moment, there are two test farms. So one run by Filippo uh, in Cambridge and one run by me in Oxford. They have been running for over a year. And I think they've been very helpful. So the idea is that you have a, a waterfall like this. And then every time uh, somebody commits to the trunk of uh, at the SVN trunk, um, Billbot will detect the, the, the commit. And it will trigger um, nightly a build of all the test suite. And it will test on different architecture using different compilers. So all are, those are all the different slaves on different machines. Um, the issue at the moment is um, so I was able to scavenge uh, basically four machines in Oxford, so four old machines, and already one of them died from the hardware issue. So it would be nice to have a small test farm for Quantum Expresso, but maybe a more uh, recent one. So if there are a bit of money available, that would be, I think, very useful. Um, I think a test shoot and a test farm is really important to ensure um, the long-term long -term stability of, of the code. Um, so actually, at the moment, the test should relies on the test code, uh, the Python test code code, that um, is also used by different um, uh, codes. So I think that's quite nice because then other people can also improve that code. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's a good that's a good idea. And um, yeah, so far it has been proven quite useful. So some bugs have been detected immediately after being committed. Um, so something that could work. Uh, with GCC or Intel, could then not work on different architectures. So, so I think it's very good. Um, so I think if we, uh, as a community, want to move towards having a, a test suit, that what is really needed at the moment is uh, increasing the test suit, so adding more tests. Um, the problem is that it's difficult for me, because I don't know all the part of the code, to add those tests. Um, because you need both to know what physical quantity you want to extract, and also what is the acceptable tolerance you are ready to, to have. So it would be nice if, if people that are expert and that are developer of, of those different parts, if they could contribute to those tests. So here I, I just have a, a proposition of people that might contribute. So for example, Yuri um, for TDDFT, maybe Paolo Umari for the GW, uh, Andrea maybe for Phonons. So I've listed a, a, a few people. And maybe for the code fest, if they have a bit of time, if they can or later, if they can commit some of the tests, that would be very useful. And actually, I've recently added some documentation on how to add a new tests uh, to the test suite. So it's if you go into the doc and develop a man, there will be a bit of documentation to explain how to add new tests. Um, and then if we have a, a, a test that tests enough properties of our software, at that point, I think we should really decide to use that test suite as a conti uh, con um, continuous integration tool, which means that we should impose some rules. So either using a software or using a hardware. So the software would be simply if, when you commit a development to the SVN trunk, if you commit breaks the test farm or part of the test farm, you should at least automatically receive an email that tells you, oh, you didn't pass the test, for, uh, test farm. Please do something about it. So at least you know. Uh, and the hard way would be simply that the once you submit your contribution, this triggers the test uh, farm. And then only if you pass the test farm, then it is added to the SVN trunk or to the Git trunk. So for this hard way, technically, it's easier if we use Git than SVN. But I guess it's possible to do something with SVN at that level as well. Um, so this is a, a simple um, view, but I know that some people have been working on that. So I think, indeed, having something like NetCDF or HDF5 it is really nice. It allows for code interoperability. Inter uh, 
you can be portable to different machines, you can have metadata, um, you use small disk space, um, so that's comparable to a binary file. Uh, you can have optimized I.O. and all of that. But what I want to stress on is that I think NetCDF is much easier to use than HDF5. So I have, a, I have a bit of expertise on NetCDF. I have no expertise in HDF5. I looked a bit at the existing HDF5 new routine that have been produced, and I must say I'm, I'm a bit scared by um, what I saw. So from a, a developer perspective, I think it's a bit difficult. So if we really, so first of all, do we really need all the features of HDF5? If the answer is yes, um, would it be possible to have a nice wrapper? So something quite easy, like you call something like right crystal, and then in the back end, without you seeing it, it will uh, call the necessary HDF5 routine. If we have something like that, then, then that's perfect. Um, but if it's too complicated, I think just people won't use it. So that would be a bit, um, yeah, that would be not ideal. Uh, and finally, I would just want to present uh, a new feature that we are working on in EPW um, that is currently in development. So this is related to uh, carrier transport in uh, semiconductor. So already in the code, you have the possibility to compute uh, electric resistivity or conductivity uh, in metals. Um, and this is, um, so this is simply a plot of uh, lead. Um, and this is the resistivity of lead, and this relies on the alpha square f Eliasberg transport uh, spectral function. This is already in the code, and that works uh, pretty well. So if you use spin orbit coupling, you get something quite decent with, uh, in agreement with experiment. And what we are working on uh, now is the linearized Boltzmann transport equation, and the idea is to describe the uh, out of equilibrium um, um, distributed uh, occupation function. Uh, based on transition rates, and the transition rate uh, can be expressed in terms of electron phonon matrix element, which can be computed efficiently using uh, EPW. And the idea is that this Boltzmann transport equation has an iterative solution, which is also coded, and we can have a nice approximation, which is called the self-energy relaxation term approximation, which allows you to directly link this scattering rate with the imaginary part of the electron phonon self-energy. So in the case of silicon, this looks like this. So you have the electronic band structure, and overlay on top of it, you have the imagining part of the electron <coughs> phonon self-energy, which is also called the line width. So here you have the density of state, and you have the line width, and if using those line width, you can then compute the mobility. So in the case of silicon, the intrinsic carrier mobility of, um, of silicon, you can compute the intrinsic hole or intrinsic electron um, mobility, and you can see that we overestimate a bit with respect to experiment uh, the mobility. So this is uh, currently being developed in, in EPW. Um, so I want to thank the people that work with me on EPW, so Carla Verdi, um, Filciano Giustino, and uh, Roxana Margin, as well as um, some funding and computational time, and you for your attention. <laughs>